and enhance nonlinear effects. This is uh, this is the team consisting of students, postdocs, colleagues um, who are now scattered around the world, but all of them have contributed to this work. And in particular, I'd like to point out. Sorry, let me just turn my laser pointer on uh, Joshua Lordesami, who did the experiments um, that I will be talking about. Dick, good. All right, now this is a presentation about solitons and, and this slide is merely here to show you that they are quite ubiquitous and occur in a lot of different physical systems. This is by no means exhaustive, but it gives you an idea of um, applic applications in telecom and ultra fast lasers and in optical buffers. But you may well ask, what in fact is a soliton? And let me just take one slide to um, take you through uh, the elementary theory. So as most of you will know, a soliton is a stationary pulse that or that propagates through an, a nonlinear medium that also has dispersion. And a particular nonlinear effect in optics that one is interested in is the Kerr effect, according to which the refractive index n depends linearly on intensity with an offset, which is the linear refractive index. And for argument's sake, and to be consistent with the experiments, I'll take N2 to be positive here. Now, when this pulse propagates through this, through a nonlinear medium of this type, then you generate new red frequencies on the leading edge of the pulse and new blue frequencies on the trailing edge. And the argument is in essence that where you have a gradient in intensity, then by this Kerr law, you have a gradient in, in refractive index. And if you have a gradient in refractive index, that turns into a gradient in phase. And a gradient in phase we call a frequency shift. And the signs are such that you get the red frequencies on the front and the blue frequencies on the back. Now, if you include the effect of dispersion which with, of the appropriate sign, um, then these red frequencies generated on the front go slow. These blue frequencies generated on the on, um, on the trailing edge go fast, and they are both kind of um, pushed towards the center of the pulse, and that gives you this self-reinforcing pulse that doesn't change upon propagation, even though each of these effects individually, namely the nonlinearity and the dispersion. Um, would destroy the pulse, but uh, working in tandem with the correct signs, they balance each other out. Now, the mathematics here is that these um, these pulses are described by the nonlinear Schroeder equation, which many of you will have seen. Um, this term here uh, represents the dispersion, and obviously this term here represents the nonlinearity. And uh, you, by solving this equation, you can find that this soliton has a hyperbolic secant shape. Now, these solitons can be uh, observed in waveguides and in optical fibers, uh, where gamma measures the effective nonlinearity of the waveguide, and beta 2 is a parameter that describes the quadratic dispersion. Now, one way to um, represent these solitons is in the following graph. So this figure here down the bottom, is in inverse units. So it has spatial, sorry, it has um, angular frequency on the horizontal axis and it has the wave number on the vertical axis. And the linear properties of this equation here are consistent with a parabolic dispersion relation. And because of the signs, this has a negative coefficient. And so the dispersion, the linear dispersion relation associated with this uh, the equation is the parabola shown here. What that implies is that if you have an arbitrary, totally arbitrary wave propagating through a medium with this property, and you take the Fourier transform with respect to space and time, it's all going along this parabola. Now, as we discussed, and soliton is a nonlinear object, and therefore it doesn't lie on this linear dispersion relation, and indeed it doesn't, and that's indicated by this horizontal bar here. It's in fact a line, and uh, along this line the intensity varies, and it peaks here near uh, the peak of the parabola. 
And that's just a nice interpretation due to Nail Akhmediev um, that uh, I will use later. OK, now I've given you the executive summary of solitons, um, and this was kind of the basic, I, the, the, the basic sort. Over decades, these have been studied with all kinds of variations, and this is not even remotely exhaustive, but if coupled solitons with different frequencies, polarizations propagating in different waveguides, propagating in different directions. People have looked at more complicated nonlinear effects. People have looked at combinations of dispersion and nonlinearity. But what has on the whole not been changed in this time is that the dispersion has always been at least to lowest order quadratic. Now, there's a good reason for that, because this quadratic dispersion, which describes the linear um, related, the, the linear dependence of the inverse group velocity with frequency, is kind of the first term in a Taylor expansion. And so it's more or less always there. It usually dominates. And if it doesn't, then the mindset is mean, oh, we either need to uh, we can neglect it because it's small or it's somehow it needs to be needs to be managed. Um, and what we have found, in fact, is that designing waveguides with have a, which have a negligible beta two is actually quite hard and uh, fabrication is even more so. So. Um, but nonetheless, there was this, this experiment by uh, my co-worker Andrea Blanco Rodondo about five or six years ago who reported a waveguide uh, or experiments in a waveguide with dominant quartic dispersion. So both beta two and beta three were zero. And the nonlinear surety equation I showed you before is then replaced by this, this equation here, which has a fourth derivative, which is consistent with the fourth order dispersion. This waveguide was that, that Andrea used was designed for a totally different purpose, but it's happen to have this have this property uh, and Andrea, of course, uh, to her infinite credit, uh, uh, recognized this. This was an important issue. I'm sorry, guys. My phone just went. Um, OK. Uh, Martin seems to have frozen, but everyone else, uh, Martin, so you dropped yeah. out for a second there. Yeah, I think it's because my phone went off. Let me just get back here. Just hold on, guys. All right, there we go. Can you see this? Not yet, no. Uh, yes. OK. All right, I'm now on NBN, which in my home is. You dropped out again yeah. there, Martin. I know, and I don't know what to do. I just turned my phone off while I. OK, oh, well, wait a minute. All right. My NBN is just hopeless. Yeah, there we go. All right, so oh, good. Um, she found the solitons where you balance the, um, the nonlinearity with this higher order dispersion. 
Now, as I mentioned, doing this in a systematic way is hard because designing appropriate waveguides with appropriate dispersion is in fact very difficult. And so what we did instead is we built a laser that in, in effect can give you any dispersion you want. This is a standard Sawtzone laser. There's nothing particularly special about it except for one element. So um, if you look at the laser here, it has a gain element, it has some pumping elements here, the laser diode and has an isolator, it has an output coupler, it has a filter, it has some polarization control to remote locking, but the key bit here is the spectral sp pulse shaper. And that is a device that can, in effect, apply an, any arbitrary frequency dependent phase to your, to your light. Now, if you then think about dispersion, what is dispersion? Well, dispersion is the uh, frequency dependence of the uh, propagation constant. And therefore, in effect, once the light propagates, is the frequency dependence of, of the phase. So using this box, which is commercially available, you can mimic any arbitrary dispersion profile. Now, it is applied at a fixed position rather than distributed, but you can manage that difference between the two. OK, so what can you do then? So you have now a laser that you can program in any arbitrary dispersion. So you can think, what would be fun to do? Well, one thing to do is to have pure dispersion of high order. And uh, the relevant equation is here. Uh, we've done it with sixth order dispersion, eighth order dispersion, tenth order dispersion. Um, to my eye, these pulses, so sorry, on the left hand side, you see the spectrum on the right hand side, the temporal profile, and in the center, you can see the spectral gram. If that doesn't mean anything to you, don't worry. Now, these pulses look very, very similar. Um, but nonetheless, we have um, given them a, um, a very careful analysis, um, including the scaling of the energy with the pulse width. We have done in situ dispersion management uh, measurements compared with the numerics, and we have ascertained that beyond doubt, these are sixth, eighth, and tenth order dispersion solitons. Now you will say they look pretty dull to me. They look like uh, bumps with. Uh, with with wings. Can you do anything else? And that's where I get to the main bits, namely combinations of different orders of dispersion. These have been looked at for, well, for since uh, 1994 by Carlson and Huck, and it has been coming back uh, over the years. And there was a, re a recent paper by Vladimir Krokov and John Hart. And let me take you through some of the experiments that we have done. So on the left hand side, you can see in the orange curve here is the dispersion relation. This is a purely quartic dispersion relation. You can see the energy density here as a function of wavelength, and this is a pure quartic soliton, and this is what it looks like in the time domain. Now we're going to add a little bit of positive um, quadratic dispersion, and when you do that, the dispersion relation gets two ears, and you can see that the energy then separates into one associated with the low short wavelength one and one with the a long wavelength one. And you can see that reflected in the spectrogram and you see a narrowing in, in the time domain. And if you make that quadratic dispersion larger, then you get in effect, as you see here down the bottom, two separate solitons in different wavelength, about five nanometers apart, reflected in the spectrogram, which shows that these solitons not only have different wavelengths, but they are coincident in time and they're coherent objects and therefore they interfere with each other. And you get these absolutely gorgeous pulses um, that I'm showing here um, because of this. Uh, and and the, 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 the period here in time is 2 pi divided by the separation here in frequency. Well, then you can say, gee, if we can have solitons with two peaks, can we have more than that? And sorry, this is already what this is what I've already mentioned. So can sorry, we, Martin, can we that's your 14 minutes, although we can probably allow a few extra minutes because we are on time. OK, thank you. Uh, thank you, David. And this is I'm getting towards the end. So 
you can say, well, if you do, if you can do, do two peaks, you can do three, four, and five, and indeed we have done it. So these are experiments that were published um, uh, or results that were published um, uh, earlier this year. Um, you can see the, the well-known multi-frequency uh, interference effects here when you go to three, four, and five peaks. Now you will say this is all kind of nice and 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 dandy. Um, is this is this is this useful? And the answer is yes. Now before I talk to that, I I, I go to that. I just want to point out that some of these dispersion relations here, these orange ones, are 18th order polynomials. This really re um, uh, reflects the fact that we can dial in or program in any dispersion we want. So we have. Together with these experiments, we have developed a comprehensive theory and we have shown that the envelope here, the dashed curve, uh, satisfies a nonlinear Schoener equation, which is perhaps not surprising because most things in nonlinear optics do, at least to some approximation. And this is actually a very good one. What is interesting about that is that um, if you look at the effective nonlinear coefficient of this envelope here, it is larger than that when you just have a simple soliton without this interference effect. And the idea here is that what you you have these ex, when you have these interference here, you have these extra high peaks here, and you have these um, these troughs, and the nonlinearity is such that you gain more in the peaks than you lose in in the in the valleys, and therefore the effective nonlinearity goes up. And we've shown that both experimentally and theoretically. Um, what this shows here is the effective nonlinearity compared to that for an ordinary soliton versus the number of Fourier components. Um, and one of these is the, the red dots are the experiments, and then the, the triangles and the snowflakes or the hexagons are theory and numerics. And um, they're all pretty well on top of each other. The experiment gets quite hard when you go to uh, five spectral components, but it's still pretty good. So what have we shown? Well, first of all, um, I've shown what I think is a very powerful experimental capability, um, namely that you can dial in any arbitrary dispersion you want within limits that are imposed by the device that you can buy commercially. We have, I think I've shown you some gorgeous soliton experiments with really beautiful um, um, results and because of this enhanced nonlinearity, there are some very realistic applications that we're looking at at, at the moment. Um, and perhaps surprisingly, this is a system with gain and loss. It's a laser system, of course, but the laser output is consistent with the theory for passive systems. And that is because the gain and the loss in effect don't do very much. They just make sure that energy is maintains it maintains um, it sorry that the energy in the system is maintained it doesn't contribute to the pulse shaping in in, in any way we wrote a tutorial overview about this work uh, last year uh, published in APL photonics and I'd like to acknowledge uh, the funding agencies and there's my email address thanks very much folks and sorry about the hiccup thank you Martin uh, I think we've got time for one.